Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SourceForge podcast. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Bo Hamilton, senior editor and multimedia producer here at SourceForge, the world's most visited software comparison site where B2B software buyers compare and find business software solutions. Today, we're talking with Julie Southern, co-founder and CEO of Spiralinks, a women-owned business providing web-based systems for HR, compensation, and finance teams, among others. Their flagship product is a product called Focal Review, which allows users to manage various compensation plans, performance activities, and employee-related processes. So to talk more about how this all works, let me introduce Julie Southern. Julie, welcome to the podcast. Glad you could join us. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. So to get started, can you introduce yourself a little bit more and share the story behind how Spiralinks was founded? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've been in the business for a very long time, but uh, Spiralinks was founded by my late husband and myself about 30 years ago. And we were had been working for decades in the corporate technology groups of several large companies. And we saw an opportunity to service companies better by providing them small, agile teams to implement small and large custom projects, mostly centered around project management, uh, custom coding, um, with especially with all the new technologies around the expanding corporate use of the internet at the time. We went from mainframe to desktop to some workstations, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 and of course, the web was um, the most prevalent uh, newcomer uh, 30 years ago. And after some years, we rolled out the, our first release of, of Focal Review, our total rewards suite. And uh, was, we went implemented it focusing on helping to administer the budgeting and the planning and the management of the annual or, or focal, that's where the word comes from, um, employee salary review process. And it expanded uh, from there into a full compensation management tool, including, including uh, employee performance and communications. Uh, most often, which is referred to as the total reward statements, which are distributed usually to employees annually. Um, the reporting and analytics uh, features or module came out a year later with extensive analytics and standard reporting uh, that all human resources and, of course, compensation professionals use in their daily jobs. And, um, and then we moved into the employee portal or the employee dashboard um, and was expand where, where we expanded it into was um, uh, as a distribution mechanism for the total reward statements as well as other total uh, other employee communications but it also allows uh, allowed us to expand the features of the performance module like employee self-evaluation 360 degree feedback and goals etc and of course you know our continued uh, growth and expansion is uh, continued partnerships with the HRIS is out there and the integration to other up upstream and downstream products that uh, enhance the entire HR and compensation world. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk more about that. That's amazing though, that you started nearly three decades ago. That's, I think you should be really proud that you're able to kind of, uh, navigate that space and all the different changes. Cause it's, it's hard enough for me to keep track of how fast things are going with, with artificial intelligence and cloud computing. No, you're right. I mean, uh, when I got into the business, I hate to say 40 years ago, but, um, you know, everything was mainframe, everything was on premise, everything was um, a unique uh, set of technical um, skills. And in all things technology, it, and especially living in the Silicon Valley, it's like every three to five years, it's something new and, and uh, exciting. Uh, and everybody wants to be a part of it or integrated into their systems. And um, sometimes it's good for for an application, sometimes it's not good for an application. So it's always trying to um, weigh what is what is good and what's not. Yeah, there's a there's always a gold rush that everyone's trying to jump on and you know cash in that's on. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. So as far as some of the technology you're currently using, how does how does Spiralinks technology enhance employee compensation and performance management for I mean all sorts of companies, but specifically Fortune 500 companies? Right. So, um, you know, some of the key features and benefits of the tool that um, that reign um, uh, high on the evaluations that that we are in um, are things like the comprehensive compensation management. Um, it's highly configurable um, 
and it's role-based technology. So uh, an individual can come in as an administrator, they can come in as a manager, they can come in as an employee, um, and they can see the same information, but in different ways and viewed different ways based on who their role is. Um, the performance uh, management piece is a, is a natural. Uh, some companies, you know, have a performance um, cycle uh, where they go through the, you know, what went well, what went right for the employee that year, and then they level them and things of that nature. And and sometimes the perform whatever that performance rating is or the discussion during the performance influences what may be come into the next phase, which is the compensation. You know, do, do they directly associate uh, a performance rating, for example, to a range that the individual could be given as an annual increase? Or maybe it's only bonus, or maybe it's stock, or uh, stock and, and a vesting uh, solution, uh, things of that nature. Um, some of the other features that we that we uh, focus on are the data security and compliance, of course, because it's HR related information. So we work with a cloud uh, provider that uh, also um, is very, very strong in data security and compliance and GDPR and things of, of that nature. I could go into lots of acronyms, but I won't do that for this for this session. Um, we like to say that, that we work uh, on the interface to be user friendly, responsive design, so it can be on any size screen. Integration and customization, uh, something unique about our product it is that it is, being that it is in the cloud and it is a product suite for many companies, it is a, teen, a single tenant solution, which means each tenant, each client has their own instance of the tool. They aren't sharing the tool with, you know, 30 other uh, clients. Um, and with that, that allows us to give them um, not only special integration capabilities with their HRISs or upstream or downstream products, but also customizations that may not be cost effective with other, uh, some of our competitors. Some of our competitors don't even allow customization because they have a, a base product and you implement their base product and, and you have to fall within the way they do compensation policies and procedures. And, and then, of course, cost and time e efficiency. You know, our, our goal is to be is to make the H, uh, HR and compensation community as efficient and effective as possible. You know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And one is taking out the the day to day activity uh, around comp the compensation review and the performance review that can be done in software. Um, consistently, efficiently, and effectively. Okay. That's a good answer. That's a lot of, you touched on a lot of things here. Cause I want to, I definitely, I got a few questions about like the interface, um, the UI and how important that is. And, um, just the, uh, I think it's great that you talked about the security and privacy. Cause when you are dealing with an HR, um, firm and just compensation in general, it's good to have, to be on top of GDPR compliance and all the, all the latest data security policies. Um, in regard to specific types of organizations and companies, fortune 500 companies, what are some types of companies and organizations that you would say get the most value from what your company has to offer? Uh, yeah, um, probably right out of the gate is the, uh, the use of the, um, uh, multilingual multi-currency. I mean, um, Anybody that's done compensation on spreadsheets and, and you're only doing it in one currency, that's great. But when you have to uh, uh, begin to interface with uh, FX rates and things of that nature at, at uh, potentially certain frequencies, uh, the multi-currency and being able to swap very quickly, what are all these numbers look like in US dollar? What do they all look like in, in, uh, in the British pound? What do they look like in, in Euro? Oh, can I see the entire group by, by the currency that they're being paid in so that you can get that, you know, so the whole ability for the um, multi-currency is very, very strategic for us. Um, I think that uh, the organizations with complex compensation structures also benefit from our tool because it is so highly configurable. Um, with all of our clients, not one client uh, has a compensation pro policy procedure structure implementation the same. Um, we have 
companies that are growing by acquisition. So they're growing very quickly. And, you know, every three months or four months, they're bringing on another 40 to 400 people that they've just bought another company with. So the tool allows them to very quickly get that population into the performance and into the compensation database so that they can start doing the analysis across the board, you know, uh, leveling. Oh, my goodness, this this company that we brought in, they are only being paid at the 30th percentile. And our goal is to pay everybody at the 65th percentile, uh, the integration with market data, et cetera. Um, it, it, it's very, very quick and easy. Um, we have departments seeking efficiency, uh, which is probably one of the big things is that as companies grow or even as companies need to downsize their administrative staff, now one person is doing the job of three people, that department needs to be more efficient and effective. A tool can assist them in doing that. They don't have to create a report. We've got a report for that. They don't have to create, you know, email blasts. We've got that. Uh, things that um, are, you know, can be arduous for an organization. They really want to seek efficiency. You know, some real world, world examples as I was get, kind of getting into was um, it's not uncommon. I mean, I think we have three specific clients that are growing by acquisition and they, I mean, that is their business model. And, you know, we'll, we'll get a ping and say, hey, we're bringing on another 400 people and we want them in by this date. And, and you know, can we, can you help us do that? Uh, we don't have an interface yet to their HRIS or we're bringing in people from from somewhere in Eastern Europe and they don't have an HRIS and they only have them in a spreadsheet. Can you accept that? It, you know, the flexibility of our tool allows them to do it fairly quickly, easily, and with full audit capability. We use uh, an extensive uh, Oracle database and utilize all of their audit features that are very rigorous in Oracle. Okay. Yeah. I, I think in regard to the comments about uh, efficiency. I feel like we really are entering the kind of efficiency era more than ever. I think we're, uh, workers are getting more, uh, you know, accumulating more skills and becoming more just um, multi, more diverse in their skill set, really, and just what it comes down to and, and having to take on more, more roles and responsibilities. Um, now, you talked a lot about some of the factors um, but I want to ask another time to see if there's anything else you mentioned. What are some essential factors organizations should prioritize to find the best fit for employee compensation management and performance tools? Yeah, I mean, I can um, you, uh, give you some right off the top of my head. I mean, uh, ease of use. I mean, uh, uh, HR communities are usually understaffed. Uh, they are specialists in the softer side of talking with employees and um, they're not necessarily uh, have the benefit of having a technical individual on site. Um, and we want them to be specialists in the softer side. That's why they are human resources. But in the compensation world, they're of course experts in, in, uh, in Excel or in spreadsheets. But a tool that comes into the organization, they want ease of use or a quick learn. So something that is familiar to them um, and easy to use. Um, collaborative features. Um, I think that um, they need to have uh, the ability uh, to talk upstream and downstream uh, to whatever software they may have in place. It's usually with an HRIS or payroll system, but it can be a number of different things. Um, and then integration capabilities. Uh, clearly, uh, the less you have to physically upload a file to something, the better if we can do, use it through, you know, integration capabilities like APIs that those vendors may have. You want to make sure that that you have that capability, which we do, um, if, if that's something that they have. Then, of course, things like flexibility and scalability, cost and budget. Um, HR is notorious for um, being underfunded. Um, and so if they have someone in-house in that knows how to do the return on investment and to build the, the business case for getting the budget, then that's something that they can have in their back pocket when they're looking at vendors because the, the pricing of vendors really varies uh, across uh, the board uh, in terms, especially the, the cloud uh, uh, solution. It's very different than an on-premise type of, of uh, implementation. Benchmarking data. I mean, in the compensation world, 
uh, that's the one thing that they always want to do is, is benchmarking. What does a programmer one do, uh, you know, paid in the U.S. versus in the U.K. versus in France? Uh, what, it, you know, what kind of skills, uh, that sort of thing. And so that benchmarking data, being able to read in whatever value um, or whatever source uh, comes in. There's many, many different sources for benchmarking data. And our, our tool um, can do uh, all kinds of different uh, sources, and that's important. Many of our competitors can only take one source, uh, so that makes for uh, a challenge for them. Um, yeah, I talked about integration and capabilities. Um, configuration, the beauty behind our tool, I think, again, because I've got the history of doing this for many years, the configurability, if someone says, oh, I really don't like that, and it's right there in the admin panel with regards to configuration, you don't have to drop out, have a programmer uh, make a customization, which costs money, and uh, it can be done very quickly. And then, of course, scalable. And um, we've uh, proven that we've had clients everything everywhere from 100 clients to uh, 320,000 clients or employees in the in the database. Uh, so it scales very easily uh, and uh, with with um, very very uh, minimal. Uh, effort and impact on on speed, um, and then of course security and compliance. You uh, you know anybody that's looking for a tool really want to, wants to make sure that it's not uh, on a machine under somebody's uh, desk <laughs> that they're working on. And I, I think that you had mentioned something about you know any wisdom or or uh, in advice on on looking at that type of uh, tool. And the one thing that I always try to uh, pull out of um, uh, potential clients in in doing a review is that you know what are your need, what are you your needs what is the problem you're trying to solve and then I can try to set up a a demonstration or a demo of our tool on how it can satisfy that I also say make sure you engage your stakeholders if it's just one person that wants the tool and they're doing the review you may be uh, spinning uh, spinning your wheels a lot you want to make sure there is a stakeholder um, support, both in emotional, physical, and financial support. And then, of course, when you have all that, then you have all the um, information you have to, to really provide a great um, return on investment, uh, which is very, very impactful for any management um, presentation on saying, hey, I want to go with this tool, and this is what it's going to cost, and this is the time frame, and et cetera. I always say uh, as a uh, follow up, though, uh, to always find a partner or find a vendor that will that you can partner with, that they're learning, we are learning, um, etc. You don't want to just, uh, you know, this is not something that you just pick up off the shelf um, and install on a machine and, and go with it. You, you There's a lot of um, uh, intricate calculations and um, scenarios that need to be addressed in the compensation world. And you want to make sure a partner uh, has that compensation knowledge as well as uh, the ability to want to learn with you to uh, expand your success or ensure your success and expand their tool. Hmm. Yeah, I hope our listeners are taking note because that's some good advice that you're sharing right here. There's a lot of, lot of stuff to, to cover. I, I'm curious, when you're having conversations with potential clients to work with, are there any alternative solutions that they typically weigh against Spiralinks? Um, curious to hear, like, what, what, how do you differentiate yourself from the the competition? Because I imagine there's a lot of competition out there. That's a great question. I can I can probably boil it down to three different scenarios. Um, the first scenario um, of of opportunity or or potential client is someone that has no tool at all. They're either using spreadsheets, manual emails, you know, instant message, whatever, whatever combination. They don't have a tool, and they need a tool. Um, and so that is one client that comes uh, to us. Uh, a second client is uh, one that has a tool, a tool they're very unhappy with, whether it is because they aren't expanding their features, they have poor support, it's. Um, you know, not user friendly. Some something for some reason that they they want to leave the tool that they have, and then the third is that they the 
the HR community, um, the compensation mostly community has expressed an interest in a tool. They already have one of the big box HRISs out there that have you know 10 or 15 modules of which one of their modules is compensation and one is performance. And they'll say, hey, you know, they wanna upsell their opportunity and they'll say that, you know, we've, we've got that module. They look at that module and they realize it's very basic. And if they are going to embark upon this exercise of implementing software to help them with their compensation and performance, let's get something that meets their needs a bit more rather than being forced into a box. Uh, so those are probably the three types of, if I had to boil them all down, uh, three types that usually come to us. So of those three, what, what's the most challenging to convey to the clients to kind of ease their concerns? You had to pick one. Oh boy, um, yeah, no, uh, probably the the most straightforward and and easy to convey is is the is those that do not have a tool because they see the tool and they're like, oh wow, <laughs> you know, this is gr this is great, and and we you know uh, how we can do it. Uh, probably the most challenging is uh, a combination of the other two, which is. Um, they have a tool and they need to get off of it, but the other tool is so inexpensive um, that they have to they have to uh, come up with the reason why they're going to go off that tool, both from a financial perspective and a labor in implementing a new tool. And, and in combination is if you're going up against one of the the uh, larger um, uh, HRIS suites, then you know it's not uncommon for them to you know they want everything, all the functionality within HR uh, to fall within their product suite. So they'll really undercut on price for that module. So that's not uncommon. Okay. That makes sense. I, I'm curious. Um, so I, we touched on this earlier about user experience, intuitive design, and how important that is uh, for any software, but uh, you know, especially the adoption of management tools that are controlling and, and connected with so many different types of, of services and functions. Um, you know, if, if it's not intuitive for me to use, I get frustrated. I want to find a better solution. I will, and I will find one, you know, I will switch platforms, whatever it takes. So what guiding principles would you say shape how Spiralinks's platforms are crafted to be both user-friendly for casual and power users? Um, we, we have a philosophy that, um, that it, it really needs to be a user-centric design. Um, compensation is a very sophisticated um, vertical um, in the HR community and it's highly financial. So there's a lot of calculation involved. So um, making something very intuitive that's not just very spreadsheet related uh, is something that you wanna make sure that you, uh, and of course, with all the new technology out there and uh, that, people have just on their phones, they want something that is uh, uh, user centric. Um, of course, intuitive navigation, it, you want it to be a natural flow of the scenario that a manager would need or an HR professional would need or a compensation professional need, or even employee wanting to go in and take a look on their dashboard, what is their compensation? Um, so you wanna make sure that navigation is natural. I imagine it's constantly, you're constantly tweaking and hearing feedback too constantly tweaking. We, we put out a release every year. Uh, so it's continuous improvement. Um, and we have for many years and uh, we really feel we have a, a, a product that satisfies many different uh, markets, whether it's uh, uh, pharmaceutical, technical, uh, financial, um, hourly, manufacturing. Uh, so a, a broadband, very rich tool that uh, many of our competitors don't have nearly as much functionality. Uh, it can be overwhelming to some of our smaller, smaller organizations that don't need that sophistication yet. So it's our job to really to listen to what they need, what the problem is, give them something that will uh, f help them fix that problem and then see how they can utilize the tool to grow with and have more sophistication and reporting. Um, you know, 
just being able to offer the tool to more than just the compensation professionals, but to managers, senior managers, you can have that, you can set up dashboards for many different roles. So a dashboard that an HR administrator is looking at for like wage gap analysis may be different than a dashboard that an executive is looking at to see, okay, what's my spend against my budget? Um, which is a different different than what maybe a manager looks at who wants to look at the dashboard prior to the review and says, okay, the, my 10 people, where are they in the market? And, you know, let's see how they're performing and, and that sort of thing. So different dashboards is, is a really, really strong feature that all of our clients really use. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I have a lot of respect for, for a good, you know, well-crafted UI, but also the UI designers and developers out there, because I mean, you, everyone's different. And if you change something too much, you're going to risk losing the customer and frustrating them. And then they're getting, they're getting feedback from the end user and then management. And there's only so many, so many resources. So it's, it's a tough uh, kind of needle to thread there. It definitely is. I mean, you, you know, some of the other guiding principles that we work with are, um, you know, we love the role-based uh, customization and configuration that we utilize. Um, to the, the simple example was the one that I gave you is that based on whatever role you are uh, assigned, whether it's one or multiple, you can see the data different ways, slice and dice it different ways, and it's all uh, uh, served up to you. Um, the integration capability is something that we really want to make sure that we are consistent with the APIs and the GDPRs and things like that that are very important on integration between different platforms that you want to share the data with. Yeah, um, could you could you elaborate on some of the integration platforms some more? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, uh, the the cloud has a very interesting API uh, approach. Some some of the HRISs out there uh, were late adopters to APIs because you know it's sensitive data. You don't want other people coming in and grabbing data. So it, they they really had to go through a process of moving to the API. Uh, and now I'm getting uh, uh, into more historical, but you know, uh, usually the way uh, data was delivered between tools um, of our nature were straight flat files uh, type of what we called sneaker net. Um, and what APIs now provide is that literally at a push of a button, you know, two seconds later, you could have grabbed, you know, the information you need from your payroll system or your HRIS system or pushed it to your HRIS system or your payroll system. Um, and um, we utilize either the HRI, the APIs that are provided by the HRISs uh, or payroll systems, or we have our API that we utilize, the standard APIs. If they don't have any, we have them as well. So we usually, it usually takes a, a you know, a, a quick meeting with their technical professional to decide what is the best solution for that implementation. And we go with that. And that's where we are very flexible because we are consistent. I'm curious, what, uh, kind of on that historical note, what, when did you make that transition kind of to the API? Do you remember yeah. kind of a pivotal year or two or? Um, no, I mean, I think it, it probably all started around uh, uh, when we made the decision um, to move permanently from an on-premise solution to the cloud solution. We were doing custom cloud solutions uh, as the cloud uh, uh, data centers were evolving, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And about eight years ago, uh, we took the approach that we were going to convert all of our existing clients from on-premise to the cloud solution, and then, and then try to focus all new implementations on cloud implementations. And uh, that's pretty much the standard now. We do get requests occasionally for on-premise implementations, uh, mostly government <laughs> um, or very secure environments whose names I cannot say. Um, but they have their own, uh, as it, and I call them private clouds, um, uh, because you can uh, get to them, um, but it, it's, it's their private cloud. It's not, they don't come to us. We go to them sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I imagine the, the, so the cloud computing boom, I mean, that, that was in the 2010s and onward, and it really was accelerated during the pandemic where we were kind of forced to live remotely, work remotely engage remotely, um, you know, this was, I feel like the direction headed as a society for a while, but it kind of jumped us forward like a decade or so out of necessity. 
Um, given, given the increasing use of online management tools, how do you see spiral links adapting or continuing to adapt to this remote work life that many of us are experiencing? Yeah, no, um, um, the adaption of the remote work life has been at the forefront of our tool for a very long time because we worked with global, global companies and all the global companies. Uh, at the time needed to be able to uh, do that, whether it was on, on in their own personal intranet um, uh, or special dashboards or uh, whatever. Um, but you are right. Um, the pandemic accelerated probably by 10 years. In be, Having been in the IT um, area for, for <laughs> 40 years now, um, you know, from dial-up support to, uh, you know, needing to hop on a plane to get, go to the data center. Um, we've always done some manner of remote support. Um, so from an application perspective, we always wanted an application that was easily supported remotely. So when the pandemic uh, came around, it escalated and it increased the appetite of clients needing, uh, being able to have meetings regularly rather than needing to get in the car and drive four hours to a meeting or hopping on a plane to have for a one hour meeting um, and have them more frequently, as well as uh, them needing to manage their staff that were remote as well. So having the cloud solutions rather than passing spreadsheets around or needing to come into the office to perform your performance uh, um, review for your employees is something that has really been beneficial. And we've had a tool that has always been able to do that. And the beauty behind our tool is that during that period of time, especially we you know, had a, a, a large increase in the number of clients because we could implement so quickly because we were already there. But you know, we will, re we will um, react to the environment as, as it increases. You know, and we've not said anything about AI yet, but I'm sure you'll get to it. And, and you know, we, we ebb and flow with the technology. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really interesting. I like how you said that it's, um, you've always had remote, uh, manners of remote systems in place, but I think it kind of goes down to kind of back what we were saying about efficiency and how we've gotten a lot more efficient and the ability to tap into and, and call somebody on demand. Um, the remote solutions has really drastically improved. It just gotten way quicker and more seamless. And, and, and the security has gotten significantly better. Mm. And, and so, um, you know, what is there today is it was not there 15 years ago. Okay. Um, so those like on-premises companies you work with probably correct. have migrated correct. to the cloud by now. Right. You know, they could control their environment by having it on-premise in their own, their own, uh, network and things of that nature. And so now that it's open and in the cloud, the, the security had to, had to um, follow it. And when that security was there, then it really expanded. And that was where it really got great. <laughs> it's now, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I, now looking ahead, are there any emerging trends that you are closely tracking that we haven't touched on? I know that you did kind of tease the AI trend, um, but any other things you're watching closely? Uh, you know, um, I, I have to say uh, AI is probably the biggest. Um, I mean, it's the biggest bu buzzword out there in, in everything. And, and I, as a, as a technology professional, I, I laugh and about people's definitions of AI. You know, five years ago, everything was data analytics, data analytics, data analytics. And AI is not far from data analytics. It's just looked at it in a different way, serving it up in a different way maybe it doing the analysis for you. Um, I, what I want to make sure that we don't, uh, we as a, as a community, not just me, not just Spiralinks, not just the HR community, but, you know, don't, don't, uh, uh, don't sacrifice quality and the employee engagement in, in just to put in a technology. People want to talk to people especially about compensation and performance. Um, what they don't want to know is that they just, you know, go through a, a questionnaire. They never see their manager. They never see an HR professional. They never hear from them. It's just a bot or it's just a, an email that is answering their questions. And then all of a sudden they receive a letter that says 
congratulations, you've received a 3% increase and, oh, because of market, uh, there's no bonus this year and et cetera. So that, you know, let's not sacrifice the softer side of HR and compensation uh, in order to have technology. So that's more of our concern and what we're watching because everybody says, what are you doing in AI? What are you doing in AI? And I, I still think that the HR and, and compensation community is still learning where it can best be used without sacrificing. Yeah, no, I, that's a good answer. I feel like a lot of companies are kind of forced to, to jump in this, this the AI bubble, whether they have a, a, a actual product in mind or a solution that it answers. Uh, there's just, it's just so much hype around it right now. It's, it's really fascinating to watch. Correct. Well, and it goes back to my initial thing. We, the organizations that come to us want to become more effective and efficient. And we try to get out of them. What is your problem? But if your answer is AI and the two don't meet, then uh, you're going to have a hard time finding a solution. Mm. Well, and also when you have your company that's focused on human connection and, and working with clients directly and meetings and, you know, all that it's, it's, I like what you said, it's important to keep, don't lose the human connection, keep, uh, keep that intact. And now, um, we're coming to the last handful of questions I have for you. And I think these are kind of fun because they make for great short clips that I think help uh, listeners, you know, get a lot of insights into your view as a business leader. So. My, my first question is, what's the most challenging decision you've had to make as a leader and what did you learn from it? Uh, yeah, um, and I'll put it in the context of, of just Spiralinks and not in my entire career. Um, for Spiralinks, I think the, the most challenging was to put into, to decide and to put into place the whole pivot from um, on-premise to cloud. Um, cloud implementations, um, were very long, very uh, profitable, very um, uh, large teams, usually large teams. I mean, um, most companies that could afford a on-premise solution were, you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 employees. And we did a lot of those, um, but it was very invasive in terms of getting on a plane, needing to spend two weeks in Singapore, or Hong Kong, uh, London, France, etc. Not that that's not fun, uh, but um, it, it you know it's a lot of long days and um, and large teams, and sometimes it's very um, it was very challenging doing that. And the business model for an on premise is very different than a cloud. Moving to cloud, you had to move everything um, that we had, same functionality, um, but to a technology that the cloud understood and was secure, and you could perform the exact same features and functions in the cloud um, without losing anything uh, that you were losing on premise. And the, the learning point behind that was the whole business model for it. The cloud is people are think that they can turn things on and turn things off, turn things on and turn things off. But to implement a, a, an enterprise solution or a, a suite uh, of any capacity like payroll or HR or compensation or performance, you do it for a period of time. You're not doing it for just a month. You may only use the tool ex extensively for six to eight weeks out of a 12 week, a 12 month year, but you're always referencing it. And so the business model from a vendor perspective is very, very different in billing um, and profit. Um, so that was probably the, the, the biggest change and to put it into place so that uh, it's uh, good for both of us. Hmm. Well, I love that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Don't be afraid of the cloud. Now, the other question I have for you, what qualities do you think are essential for someone aspiring to be a leader in today's business world? Uh, well, the first that comes right, right from the, the top is focus. Second is ethics. Um, you're, you're dealing with a lot of people. You're do, dealing with a lot of people, not face to face. And so you are being restricted to reading body movements and things of that nature to know what kind of a partnering possibility you can have with a client. And I think that 
in, in any career, but most importantly, I think in, in, a, in a business like a, a cloud software solutions is to really focus. What is, what is it that you want to um, uh, satisfy with this product and do it ethically? Um, and uh, because you want to keep the relationships, you want to make sure that the relationships that you build up are a partnering opportunity, a partnering situation and not where you just get dumped or, or you want to dump them or they dump you or something of that nature. And, and then um, I think it's very important and, and goes hand in hand with that, um, the focus on the ethics is the customer service that is provided uh, in any sort of product or service that is delivered to a client, I think. So I don't know if that, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, no, that's a great, I think that's such a great way to sort of wrap this up too. I mean, that's, it makes me think a lot about just big picture. I mean, I always struggle with, with focus and when I'm on a task, I, I, there's so many distractions out there, especially when working remotely. Um, so it's, it's important to stay focused, but also, like you said, to have ethics, have a good heart. Don't get, you know, don't, don't get tempted to take a shortcut necessarily. Um, and all of that implies it's just, I think that's a great way to end it. Yeah, really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> and don't forget the human side of things. <laughs> the human so, connection. The human well, connection, exactly. Well, thank you. Those are all the questions I have for you, Julie. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to sit down with us and talk about Spiral Links. Well, I truly appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity. Of course, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you all for listening to the SourceForge podcast. I'm your host, Bo Hamilton. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date with all of our upcoming B2B software-related podcasts. I'll talk to you in the next one.